probably like most people, you associate cotton with the plantations of the Old South. However, uh, the really Old South, the Colonial South, there, there wasn't very much cotton agriculture. It was primarily tobacco to begin with. And then later in South Carolina, a lot of rice agriculture, rice plantations and indigo. Uh, but cotton came about really, really much later, after the colonial period, when the, uh, the colonies had become the United States. And that's that's because it was not really uh, the, the harvesting of cotton was not really cost effective in the colonies because the cotton is full of seeds and those seeds have to be picked out. Uh, and so if you had a plantation and you had slaves, uh, you would have to have a lot of manpower involved, not just in collecting the cotton, picking the cotton, but picking out the seeds. And it was so time-consuming that really the investment uh, would not yield you very much in return. And, and that changed. That changed in the 1790s. Now, there was some cotton production in the year 1791, I believe, and we'll look at a more comprehensive chart in a bit. There were 5.5 million pounds of cotton produced in the United States, but that was really just a drop in the bucket compared to what would come later and what was being produced elsewhere in the world. Well, the, the change that came about was due to this thing, the cotton gin, which by the way has nothing to do with liquor, uh, gin as in short for engine. Um, this, uh, this device enabled you to put the cotton in and basically it would extract all the seeds, which uh, made the whole process approximately 50 times faster. Well, uh, with the process being made 50 times faster all of a sudden, then it requires a lot less manpower and therefore has much more potential for profitability. Uh, Eli Whitney is the one who invented this thing. Uh, here's a look at the, uh, uh, the workings inside that gin. Eli Whitney uh, got his start in the early 1790s by uh, coming up with the idea of machine-tooled musket parts that were therefore interchangeable. What does that mean? Well, before this time period, if you wanted to buy a rifle or a musket, um, the, you, were, you were buying a, a weapon that had been built by a master craftsman. A lot of them were built actually uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and the, uh, the gunsmith who made it went through the whole process uh, sort of by hand. And what that meant was that if one of the pieces in your musket broke or became defective or wore out or whatever, and it had to be replaced, you would have to take that weapon to a gunsmith who would then have to uh, basically uh, measure, the, measure the piece and, and uh, uh, construct a, uh, a replacement that would exactly fit the specifications of the gun and because everyone was a little different because the individual gunsmith who had made the thing to start with uh, kind of did things by, by, by thumb, as it were. So with machine-tooled parts that were all the exact same size, that means it's a lot easier to get a replacement part, which means they're a lot cheaper because they're more widely available and they fit on everything. So this was uh, revolutionary for the, uh, the gun business. And then he took that, uh, some of those ideas and then transferred them to revolutionizing the cotton business. 
So there's there's that number. 1793 it was. Uh, Five million pounds of cotton, which had actually gone down a little bit because I did find numbers for 1791 that said 5.5. So, uh, five million uh, pounds in 1793, the year this thing was invented. 170 million pounds by... Uh, 27 years later in 1820, so about a, a quarter of a century. That is a significant increase in the amount of cotton being produced. Now, consider that this is the 1790s and the Industrial Revolution is underway. It has begun in Europe and is uh, starting to uh, have its effects felt in the United States. In in, in a sense, Eli Whitney's inventions were part of the Industrial Revolution, Uh, but it was kind of perfect timing because uh, the the cotton agriculture business augmented by this device was a perfect match for the Industrial Revolution. They went hand in hand. What do I mean by that? Well, not only picking out the seeds of the cotton was revolutionized, the whole process had been mechanized, industrialized, and made much more efficient. And uh, this was done by the, uh, the use of of mills that initially, initially, um, factories and mills were operated by water power. Uh, any any uh, textile mill, or really any kind of factory that was being built at that time, would always be built by a river because they'd have this water wheel, and then the power of the current of the water would turn that, and that operated the machinery. Uh, Thirty years later. Uh, came the development of the steam engine that uh, uh, allowed you to produce power by burning stuff, uh, coal mostly. But initially it was, uh, it was water power. Uh, and actually, the first factory in the United States uh, was built in Rhode Island in the 1790s. Uh, and textile mills quickly started to show up throughout New England, especially in Massachusetts. So what this means is that they're growing a lot more cotton in the South, okay? And then they take that cotton and they're sending it up North to these factories and textile mills that will then process that, uh, you know, pure cotton into cloth, which can then be made into clothing. Now, they would do that, and there would also be some percentage of the raw cotton that would be shipped overseas to other countries, mostly England, who also uh, were building a lot of textile mills and other kinds of factories. And so they would do that process there, and they would sell the cloth there. In some cases, but not very many, plantations in the South or large farms in the South would build a mill of their own and do the whole process there. But uh, that didn't happen very often. Most of them were in the north. Well, tobacco agriculture, which had started right in the early 1600s, that was part of mercantile capitalism. And uh, um, mercantilism uh, was really among other things, a protectionist way of operating the economy and trade. That means that under a mercantile economy, which all the colonial powers operated under in the 1700s, uh, the government, like the government of England or the government of France, is going to make sure that the merchants and the producers in their country are the ones that are getting the business. They don't want you giving business to some people from a different country. However, with the Industrial Revolution, this also kind of widened things, opened things up for um, industrial capitalism, which uh, 
means more than just doing stuff with machines. It also means uh, finding markets, uh, free markets, uh, so that things could be sold kind of globally uh, from country to country. So uh, that uh, that's exactly what was happening here with all this cotton that's being grown. Some of it's being processed in the United States, but some of it is being sent over to Europe to be processed there. And this is developing into, pretty quickly, a very large money-making enterprise, which it had not been before. In the 1790s, they're making 5 million pounds of cotton. Most of that's going to be getting used back at that time uh, in the United States. Uh, but once they start producing, once they go from 5 million to 170 million, uh, then a lot of that stuff's being sold to foreign markets uh, and uh, is, is really opening things up and encouraging the growth of ever more cotton so that the United States started putting a huge, huge dent in the global market for cotton, which before the cotton gin, before the cotton gin, most of the cotton was being grown actually in India or in Egypt, both of which by the late 1700s were controlled by Great Britain. Now in India, they had been processing cotton for, for many centuries and they did it the, uh, the older traditional ways. By the time that the, uh, the British uh, took over uh, in, uh, in Bengal, where a lot of this was being done, uh, they, uh, the British suppressed, uh, in some ways, the uh, production of, of cotton because they wanted to produce other things like tea. Uh, and the British took over the production of the cotton, still making the, uh, the Indian people do the work, right? But the, the money was now flowing somewhere else. So India and Egypt, ultimately, therefore, Great Britain. Now, um, that, that cotton that was made and processed by hand in India and Egypt was highly valued, still is. Um, it has shorter staples or fibers than the American strain of cotton, which has longer fibers and is, uh, is preferred by factories because it is easier to process by machine. Now, uh, even today, uh, material cotton that's, that's produced in the traditional ways uh, in India and Egypt, or the 21st century version of traditional ways, is very highly sought after because it's high quality, but you can't mass produce it that way. American cotton could be mass produced, plus, plus, the United States had slavery. Great Britain um, was in the process of getting rid of slavery in all their colonies, and they didn't really have <clears throat> slavery uh, in the sense of plantation slavery in, um, you know, colonies like uh, India and, and, and Egypt. Uh, so even though they didn't pay their workers very much in India, they still had to pay them. Uh, slave labor was cheaper. That's why. That's why the slave trade flourished even in the... Uh, uh, 1600s because slave labor is cheaper therefore more profits will go uh, to the owners of the enterprise so all these things together meant that fairly quickly the United States is going to dominate the world cotton trade they're going to come from out of nowhere essentially to be right there smack dab in the middle, at the forefront. By 1860, cotton was actually more than half of the export value of the United States. What does that mean? So out of all the stuff that the United States produced and shipped overseas to sell other countries, 
more than half of it was cotton, and the other, slightly less than half, was everything else put together. So that by 1860, 75% of the world's cotton was coming from the United States. And what that really means is that it was coming from the South. So let's take a look at places where, uh, where cotton can be grown. You can see that the best places are in the Deep South, and then it can also be grown uh, just outside that range, but still pretty much in the South. Uh, the uh, chart that I referred to earlier, pounds of cotton per year, 5.5 million in 1791 um, pounds by 1831. Um, I think I said 170 earlier. It was 77.5. So that was a, uh, I was a bit off there, uh, but uh, pretty quickly it, it caught up with, with what I had said. So 1841 up to 97.5 by 1850. 245 million by 1860 around 400 million pounds of cotton compared to 5 million uh, at the beginning uh, right before the cotton gin was invented well let's think for a moment about the labor on those plantations which I've already alluded to slavery. Now, when the, uh, the Constitution was being worked out in, uh, well, 1787, 1788 uh, is going around trying to ratify it. That's only about five years before the cotton gin was invented. But the cotton gin was not invented. So most Americans, even most slave owners in the South, in the 1770s and 1780s, believed that slavery was going to die out within maybe another generation or two. It had already died out in the North. There had never been as much of it in the North, but what had been there uh, had, had pretty much died out and been replaced by wage labor um, because it was in some ways less cost effective um, in the sense that well when the uh, when the economy is very kind of volatile like it was in the 1700s you know you might have a really good year and then a really really bad year uh, businesses in the north that uh, in places like New York that had used slaves figured out that if the economy tanks, you've got all these slaves, you still have to feed and clothe them, and that's still an expense you have, even though you're not bringing much money in. And then you can't sell them because the economy is tanked and no one is going to pay uh, what you had originally paid for them. So those businesses figured out that if you don't have slaves at all and you just hire workers, when the economy tanks, you can fire them all. Uh, lay them off, a more euphemistic term, but you can just get rid of them and let them fend for themselves. And when the economy gets better, then they'll come back looking for work. And it was believed that's what was going to happen in the South too, that the South was on that trajectory so that people like Thomas Jefferson, for instance, who said repeatedly that slavery was an evil and was wrong, yet he still had slaves, uh, they would argue that yes it's an evil yes it's a wrong but it would be very very disruptive to society to end it all at once a lot of people would be losing money they had invested in slaves there'd be all these unemployed former slaves there would be you know uh, just practically armageddon they believed and that it would be better to wait and let it die off now if you were a slave you probably wouldn't look at it that way but that still was the idea Okay, well, 1793, the cotton gin comes along and changes everything. It changes everything because now, all of a sudden, slavery is not going to be dying out. It has become more profitable than it ever was, way more profitable. 
than it ever was. So uh, not only is it not going to die out, people are going to want it. Well, the people who own these, uh, these, these plantations are going to want it more than ever. And there's kind of a problem. You see, when the, uh, when the Constitution was being worked out, they, they didn't directly deal with slavery. Uh, and so they kind of kicked it down the road a little bit without really even naming it. Uh, but essentially, they decided, okay, in 20 years, we will end the slave trade. That is, there will be no more new slaves imported from Africa anymore uh, in 20 years. So that means 1808. And that was with the assumption slavery is going to die out. But then all of a sudden, you got the cotton gin. You have this very, very, very lucrative crop. And the planters are wanting slaves more than ever, but there are no new slaves coming in, at least not legally. There was a small number being smuggled in always. Uh, so what that meant was that in the places, and let's look at, uh, let's look at that map uh, of uh, where the tobacco was grown, in those places that had once had a lot of tobacco plantations, but had basically made the soil moribund and unable to grow tobacco anymore, and tobacco had moved farther west, well, those places like Virginia, the Upper South, Virginia uh, and North Carolina especially, uh, and into um, um, eastern parts of uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, they still had some slaves, but they didn't have as much need for them because they no longer could grow tobacco, and they couldn't really grow a lot of cotton either. So they started selling off their slaves to new plantations being established in the deep south in places like southern Georgia, uh, to an extent uh, South Carolina, but uh, across uh, Alabama, Mississippi, into Louisiana, Texas. So an internal slave trade flourished. There had always been such a thing, but it really just grew exponentially as huge numbers, over one million slaves ultimately, sold from the upper south to the deep south to go work on these new cotton plantations. By the way, that's one side effect of the cotton gin. Uh, now cotton is more lucrative. It can be grown much more efficiently in the deep south so a lot of plantations spring up there. They need more labor. So slavery is not going to die out like people had thought it was. But you know what they also need more is more land if they want to increase their profit by growing more cotton, more land. And who had a lot of the land in the Deep South? The Indians, the five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws. So... Uh, this was around the time that uh, those southern states started agitating to remove all the Indians. Why? Because they wanted their land to grow cotton on, among other things. Well, another big side effect of, of all of this is that the whole economy of the South started to be centered on cotton agriculture because it was so profitable and because slave labor made it more profitable the economy of the south also rested on slavery um, however it was not just the south it was really the entire country even the places where there was no slavery even the places where they couldn't grow cotton um, there was, uh, there was still connection to this, uh, well, what had come to be known as King Cotton. It, it ruled above everything. So, in the South, uh, I, I mentioned that most of the factories were in the North. Why is that? Well, in, in large part, it's because, uh, if you're in the South, and you want to invest money in something, and you're trying to get a loan to invest money in something, and what you're going to invest in is growing cotton, you're going to get the loan. 
because the bank knows they will get their money back and their interest. And they know that your, uh, uh, your endeavor will not fail because no one went broke selling cotton during this time. Uh, so um, the factories are all in the north. Not all. There's a few factories in the south, but do you know where they were? The upper south, where you can't grow cotton as well. That's where they built the few factories they had. So everything in the south revolves around growing cotton, eventually even in places in the south where you can't grow cotton. So what about the north? Well, where's the shipping taking place? Charleston Harbor in South Carolina, that was a major port. But the other major ports, you know, were New York City, Boston, Philadelphia. So the cotton that's being sent north to those textile mills to be processed and turned into cloth, well, some of that cloth is used in the U.S. Some of that is sold, already processed to Europe. And so it has to be shipped across the ocean. And it's on ships, uh, not completely, but in, in many, if not most cases, ships whose home harbor was in a northern city. Also, I mentioned bankers making loans. Well, this was a national interest. Uh, potential new plantation owners or people who already had a plantation and want to expand it, they're trying to get a loan. They don't just operate through their local bank. In fact, they're more likely to operate through the larger banks in the north. So those banks become heavily invested in the success of cotton agriculture and plantations, and therefore slavery. Also, uh, something that uh, you found a lot in northern states, uh, insurance companies. There were some in the south, but the bigger ones were in the north. Insurance companies. Well, this is a horrible, brutal, inhuman thing to say. But from the point of view of the plantation owners and the insurers and the banks, it is nonetheless true. Slaves were property, and you can insure your property. So um, plantation owners would take out insurance on their plantation, on their farm, but also specifically on their slaves uh, so that they wouldn't take a big loss, you know, if there was a you know, an epidemic or something, and they lost a bunch of slaves. Now, those factories that are turning cotton into cloth were, were doing some, uh, some things uh, with, with some of that cloth, some of them, that sort of made the whole thing a cycle. In fact, there was one company up north that did do this processing of the material, and some of the, the cloth that they made, some of the cotton cloth they made, was really rough and cheap and poorly produced. And they didn't sell that to foreign markets or even to, uh, you know, to domestic markets per se. They sold that back down south to the plantation owners because that was the cheap cloth that they used to make clothes for their slaves. And this particular company I'm talking about, they made a lot of money on that. So much money that they expanded into the really high-end market of clothing, particularly men's clothing. And they started also producing really expensive suits. Um, Brooks Brothers is the company in question. Now, there's another company. Uh, that uh, were actually not a company, but a couple of uh, guys who were partners who had made some money, I think, uh, through insuring slaves. Uh, their money had come. It was connected to the, the, the cotton agriculture and slavery. And they reinvested some of that money into opening a jewelry store called Tiffany's which, of course, is a famous place in New York City. The point is, the point is, they didn't have slaves at this point in the North. But many, many businesses, many individuals in the North were still uh, 
financially benefiting from slavery. And in the South, they really were. Um, a lot of this uh, uh, stuff that, that I've already talked about, already mentioned, the fact that there wasn't much investment in industry in the South. Um, the investment was in, in cotton or things to augment uh, cotton. Like, for example, you know, mountainous areas of uh, the Upper South in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky uh, couldn't really grow cotton, but could, all, could still have industrious individuals who could be the middlemen in transporting all those slaves from Virginia and other places that were no longer needed there and were being sold to the Deep South. So that internal slave trade, uh, even in areas where you didn't have cotton, was very, very active. Um, in fact, let's take a look at the railroads in the South. Now, first of all, be aware that the railroads in the North didn't look like this. Uh, they were uh, all pretty much interconnected like a web. So you could move anything from one place to any other place practically in the mid-Atlantic and New England states. But look at the railroad lines in the South as of 1850. You'll see there's not many of them. And they kind of branch off and go in weird directions. And most of them are not connected to one another. That's because the railroads even that were built in the South were primarily built to transport cotton from the interior to the coast to be shipped out from these major southern port cities. Now, spoiler alert, there's going to be a war between the North and the South, and one side's going to have really good railroads that enable them to transport stuff uh, much more easily, and that's going to be a big advantage for them. All right, well, I mentioned uh, how cotton by the 1850s and up to 1860 was a big part of the uh, exports. Um, one thing that I haven't talked about is uh, the number of people who owned slaves. Um, really, in the South, about 25% of white families owned a slave. That means three out of four white Southerners did not own a slave. Um, however, and a lot of folks don't, don't know this, aren't aware of it, if you were a, a yeoman farmer or a small independent farmer living on a family farm, you were middle class basically, you could rent slaves, especially in the wintertime. Uh, when there wasn't a whole lot of uh, work on the plantations, a lot of times plantation owners would rent their slaves out. And so you could have an extra pair of hands around the house to do the chores for a while, and you could be a master, even if you couldn't afford to buy a slave. You could get a taste for what that felt like to have that much control over another human being. And this is uh, part of the reason that people who didn't even own slaves could be so invested in the idea of slavery. Uh, as someone once said, in America, everyone is a temporarily embarrassed millionaire, right? Everyone thinks they're going to get rich or hopes to. So a lot of those Southerners who never could afford to own a slave could occasionally rent one and could dream of the day when they had enough money to own them. Uh, so, again, that's, that's part of the explanation for why there was so much support for a system that directly benefited only one quarter of the white population. So, um, so far as that 25%, um, only 3% owned 20 or more slaves uh, that would qualify their uh, their farm as a plantation and them as a planter. So really, uh, most, most families that owned slaves owned one or two or maybe three or four. But the really, really 
big plantations that had 20, 25, 50, 100 slaves. That's only 3% of the white population. That's not very many people. And to give you an idea of, of, of how that worked, the average cost of a field hand around 1860 translated into today's money would be about $40,000, between $30,000 dollars $40,000, about the cost of a new car. So for a family to own a slave would be the equivalent today, a white family, uh, of being able to buy a new car. You know, lots of people can't afford to buy a new car, but lots of people can. How many people have two or three new cars? Not as many. How many people could afford 20 or 30 or 40 new cars? Well, a family like that uh, are really at the top of the financial food chain. There's not many of them. So, uh, here is uh, uh, a look at uh, where cotton was being produced primarily as of, I think, this is 1860. Um, so take a look at that. Now, take a look at the slave population back in 1790. And remember the earlier um, map that we looked at with the uh, tobacco farms. So you can see 1790, uh, the areas with the most slaves the, was, it was Virginia, followed by Maryland, and then North and South Carolina, uh, that's 1790. And you'll notice that there are small numbers in the northern states at that time, 1790. Well, take a look in 1860. The, uh, the darker, these, the, the, this is a map of the counties of the south. The darker the county is colored, the more slaves were in that county. Uh, so... The ones that are uh, colored black, they had more than 10,000 slaves. So where is that happening? Uh, not in Maryland. Uh, somewhat in Virginia, but not as much. There is this band down through the deep south, uh, essentially starting up in South Carolina and coming downward. Uh, that is where the largest concentration of slaves were because that's where the cotton was being grown. Now, tobacco, I briefly alluded to earlier, uh, tobacco uh, production had to move westward of the coast where it had started in the 1600s because if you don't rotate your crops, if you grow tobacco over and over and over again in the same field and you never give that field a break you're going to deplete the soil of the nutrients necessary to grow tobacco of course the way to get around that is don't grow tobacco for a while but you're going to be not making as much money if that happens and how many people are willing to do that not a whole lot so so uh, as that land got depleted then people who wanted to grow tobacco had to go further west. Same thing happens with, with cotton. As uh, a character said uh, in uh, Steinbeck's uh, The Grapes of Wrath, you know what cotton does to the land? Robs it. Sucks all the blood out of it. Especially if, you know, you have these monoculture fields of all cotton year after year after year. Each year the yield of cotton you get per acre is going to go down significantly until eventually that land is worthless for growing cotton. And that's what had started happening. Uh, by the 1860s, after this cotton thing had been going on for about 50 years in the uh, easternmost part even of the Deep South. So they increasingly needed new lands to grow cotton in if they were going to continue to expand or even to continue to produce the same amount they were presently producing. 
You may be surprised to learn that this discussion of cotton depleting the soil leads us directly into a discussion of filibusters. However, you may be even more surprised because the filibusters that we're going to be talking about are probably not the ones you're thinking of. Uh, if you're familiar with the term, you probably associate it with uh, uh, the, the maneuver in, in Congress where a person has the floor, right? And as long as, they, as long as they keep talking, they hold the floor. And so they just talk and talk and talk. And a uh, famous movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Uh, Jimmy Stewart read a gazillion letters until his throat was hoarse. A few years ago, Ted Cruz, I think, read the complete works of Dr. Seuss in order to hold the floor. And the reason they do that, of course, is uh, that's when there is like a deadline for a vote. And if they can hold the floor and not let the other side get it, they can sort of like run out the clock until the deadline passes. Well, that's not what we're going to be talking about, but we are going to learn why that maneuver is called a filibuster. All right, so to the original meaning of the term filibuster, from the Spanish word filibustero, which is a Spanish version of actually a, a Dutch word, freibuter, which uh, means free booty-er. Now, not booty in the, uh, uh, the sense you may be thinking of, but booty is in what pirates are after, that is treasure, right? So a freibuter, also in English called a freebooter, which um, more and more students, uh, when I ask them, have never heard that term, perhaps because they don't have uh, the wide reading experience that I do. Anyway, filibuster, freibuter, freebooter, pirate, pirate. And specifically, in this context, land pirates. And by the way, that uh, photograph there is uh, of an actor portraying a land pirate uh, of sorts in, uh, actually of several sorts, in the TV miniseries uh, Dead Man's Walk, the prequel to Lonesome Dove. Anyway, uh, think about this for a moment. What is a pirate? Now, Probably you're thinking of someone who sails the seven seas and is missing various body parts. But, but really, um, more specifically than that, a pirate is someone who steals stuff and who is not sanctioned by any government or any country. They don't belong to any country. That's why the pirate... Uh, ships would have their own flags, not a national flag, okay? So a land pirate, one would assume, is someone who does the same thing on land, seizes something that they're not entitled to and not representing any government when they do it. And then that comes back to why that uh, congressional maneuver came to be called filibustering because the implication originally back when in the 19th century everyone knew the original meaning of filibuster, you know, that this congressperson is acting like a pirate. They have seized the floor and refused to turn it over, right? Uh, and so they're stealing time, in essence, from the other side. But uh, these land pirates, uh, this uh, filibuster movement, something that uh, really, really uh, started happening a lot in the 1840s and especially the 1850s. And what we're talking about are individuals, well, not individuals, groups of people led by an individual uh, that officially don't represent any government going into a country and trying to either take over part of that country or take over the whole country um, sort of independently. That's what the term land pirate means. Uh, why did this start happening so much, specifically in the 1850s? Well, you're probably aware that during the 1850s, there was more and more 
argument about moving west, opening up new territories, and whether those territories would be slave or free. And if you recall your previous uh, U.S. history lessons, you will recall that according to the Missouri Compromise or the Compromise of 1820, there was sort of a line drawn uh, across, horizontally uh, across the United States, uh, above which no new territories would be allowed to have slavery, and below which any new territories would be allowed to have slavery. Well, when we're talking about Western territories, we're talking about the Louisiana Purchase, of course, uh, but also uh, something that was gained 40 plus years later in 1848, uh, gained in the sense that it was taken away from Mexico at the end of the U.S.-Mexican War, uh, a war that had uh, really been promoted heavily by Southern politicians and opposed by northern politicians who believed that the, uh, the whole idea of that war was an excuse to take territory away from Mexico and expand slavery into new places. And of course, the reason so many southerners wanted to expand slavery into new places in the west was because they wanted to expand cotton agriculture because, as we have discussed, uh, they had already begun overusing the, uh, the soil and depleting the soil in the places where they had first begun. So, the more new places that they can get south of that, uh, that line from the uh, 1820 Missouri Compromise, the... Uh, the better. Well, expand cotton agriculture, but also any new states that might be formed that were slave states would also provide uh, members of uh, Congress that were pro-slavery, add to the pro-slavery contingent in the Senate and the House of Representatives. Well, those are the same reasons that the Knights of the Golden Circle was formed. It was a secret society. In some ways, it was sort of like a forerunner of the Ku Klux Klan, a little more than a decade ahead of time, established in 1854, and their purpose was to seize new lands in the Golden Circle. And there you can see what that is. It's essentially the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico and everything that touches it. So... Um, a good chunk of Mexico, Central America, uh, all the islands of the Caribbean, as many as possible, they wanted to annex to the United States. And if that sounds like a bold and weird plan, well, only six years earlier, there had been a war with Mexico that had annexed a bunch of territory, taken a bunch of territory, and added to the U.S. So this was actually uh, something that... Uh, potentially could work if they had independent operatives who had plausible deniability, uh, who could say they were acting independently. Uh, we're talking about filibusters. We're talking about mercenaries who could go into some of these areas and seize them, take them over, conquer them, uh, and uh, set up their own new states or take over those states, much as had happened in Texas, and then hand it over to the United States. And once it was added to the United States, it would be a new territory south of that line where there could be slavery and not just cotton agriculture, um, but also, and more importantly, sugar. Sugar, which was also still, after several centuries, extremely, extremely lucrative. So, um, they, uh, you, you started to see incidents of this happening, and frequently, 
In fact, practically every time, the uh, filibusters, the independent operatives, independent in quotation marks, were financially supported by prominent Southern politicians and or plantation owners. Sometimes kind of under the table, back room, but still funded by wealthy Southerners who uh, had a vested interest in gaining these new territories. Now, one example of this happened in Cuba with uh, Narciso Lopez, who had, uh, I think he was originally from Venezuela, but he had lived for a long time in Cuba. He was a minor government operative, and he was a poet also. And he had been um, he had been banished from Cuba, which Cuba was controlled by Spain and had been for centuries. So he was kicked out of, of Cuba. And he made three separate attempts to invade Cuba with uh, anti-Spanish Cuban refugees, Cubans who, like himself, had either been kicked out of the country or had fled the country and were opposed to the Spanish being in charge. So if you know your 20th century history, think about this for a second. Here you've got Cuban refugees who are being secretly funded by people in the United States to go and lead a revolution in Cuba to overthrow the government that is there uh, with the goal of then having a Cuba that is... uh, that is available to the interests of the United States. If that sounds kind of familiar, that's because it happened in the 60s, the 1960s, just as it happened in the 1860s with Lopez, whose third attempt, um, where he landed with uh, his army of Cuban refugees, He expected that the Cuban people would rally to his flag. And here's his his flag that he'd established for a new independent Cuba. He expected that the Cuban people would rally to his cause and together they would overthrow the Spanish. But turns out the Cuban people didn't want to get shot. So not many of them showed up. Uh, So his small army was easily overwhelmed. Um, Remarkably similar to what happened a century later with the Bay of Pigs. So he was, uh, he was executed. Well, maybe he was, I think he was executed. Maybe he, he died, uh, died in the fight, but uh, he died. Uh, that's the important thing. Uh, and that was, uh, that was the end of that. Although he was an inspiration to the Cuban people and considered a Cuban hero. And almost a century later, when Fidel Castro led a revolution against the Cuban government and installed a new government. Uh, Castro's new government adopted the flag of Narciso Lopez for the Cuban national flag, which it still is. But how this fits into our discussion, this is all a bunch of stuff about uh, things happening in Cuba, is the fact that uh, American southern plantation owners funded it. They funded it with the idea that... uh, they would be able to have the uh, um, leverage to be able to annex Cuba to the U.S. as a slave territory and later a slave state. Another uh, prominent example of a filibuster was this guy, William Walker from Tennessee, actually from uh, Hendersonville. So he had uh, several attempts that he led. He was, by the way, the the newspapers called him the gray-eyed man of destiny. So uh, he made several uh, several attempts to uh, to seize different areas with the goal of taking them over and then turning them over to the U.S. Um, in Baja California, out there south of uh, south of California, that part of Mexico, eventually. Uh, He, in fact, in his mercenary army, conquered Nicaragua, and he installed himself as president of Nicaragua, and his government was officially recognized by the United States government. 
even though uh, this was uh, really, you know, not the advisable way to form a government. Uh, however, his administration was not recognized by all of his neighbors in Latin America, uh, all of whom anticipated he would be trying to do the same thing with them. So several of those countries teamed up and defeated Walker's army and then executed him. Filibusters usually didn't end well. Well, the southern cotton industry didn't do so well during the Civil War, obviously, when there was a Union blockade that prevented uh, uh, cotton from getting out to be shipped to Europe, and when there were you know, Union armies burning down the cotton fields and so forth. However, once the war was over, it wasn't very long before the South was once again producing almost as much cotton as it had been in 1860. And they were doing that without slave labor, uh, which for one thing demonstrates they didn't need slave labor to do it. They just needed slave labor to maximize their profits. So how did they do it without slave labor while still maximizing their profits as much as they could? Well, um, a system known as sharecropping developed. Uh, that's where some of the larger plantations wound up being divided into smaller units. Uh, and those, those units, like a bunch of smaller farms, uh, would be leased to poor farmers, sort of like rented. And this is something that um, former slaves and poor white people uh, were uh, uh, involved in doing, leasing, leasing these farms and sharecropping. So this is for, for farmers who didn't have property. They didn't have enough money to buy land. They didn't really even have enough money to buy tools, but they had, uh, they had the, uh, uh, the, the work ethic and they had the, the knowledge, the agricultural knowledge. So here's how that worked. The tenants, the, uh, the sharecroppers, they would work the fields and they would give a portion of what they produced to the landowner. And the landowner uh, would not only supply the land itself, but often would also supply the tools that the farmers needed, and sometimes even the seed that they needed. So when, uh, you know, when harvest time comes around, the uh, farmers uh, uh, take in their harvest and give part of it to the landowner. Now on the surface, that sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Except it really wasn't because the, uh, the landowners weren't really giving this stuff away. They would, in fact, um, demand uh, payment for all the things they had loaned the farmers, the tools, uh, the, the seed, uh, everything, and, and often at some very high prices. So... If there was a bad year, so far as crops go, and let me tell you, eventually there will always be a bad year. If there's a bad year and the crops aren't as good as usual, then the farmer would not make anything and in fact would wind up owing. He'd be in the red, owing the landowner. Even if he did have a good harvest, he usually barely, after he paid back, the landowner barely had enough to feed his family. So there were liens on the crop, uh, which meant that, you know, they would get so deeply in debt by having successive bad years, they would have to keep working essentially for nothing, for free, because if they tried to leave, they'd be arrested because they owed the landowner. So uh, that turned out not to be such a good system after all, it trapped poor people into perpetual poverty while it uh, continued to bring money to the people who owned the land, often without them having to make uh, very big investments and no investments in labor in these cases. Now, in other cases, uh, some of the larger plantations did hire uh, 
workers. They hired laborers, not usually at the, the best of prices, but they, they did hire them. Um, this sharecropping system didn't just disappear within a few years after the end of the Civil War. It lasted well into the 20th century. Um, it was still common during the Great Depression and the middle of the century up into the 1950s and beyond. My, my grandfather, who owned a small farm uh, in the early 1940s, lost the farm when he wound up being sent to prison for making moonshine. Uh, and then uh, he wound up having to, after that, be a sharecropper. And he was a sharecropper right up until he died in 1980. And that leads us to a phenomenon that started in the 1890s when the Jim Crow era started, uh, legal segregation, known as sundown towns. Now, sundown towns were towns where it was common knowledge that if you were black, you were risking your life if you were found in that town after dark. Uh, you would be in danger of being lynched. So uh, that meant you couldn't live in that town. And it meant that uh, if you were passing through, you'd better pass through quickly. Uh, and if you had business to attend to, you'd better come in in the daylight, attend to your business, and then get out because you were not welcome. And like I said, it was dangerous. Now, in some of these towns, that was common knowledge. But in some of them, it was spelled out in signs like this one. Uh, other signs, which I, which I won't show, uh, could be much more crude, rude, profane, and threatening than this one. Now, sometimes uh, it wasn't spelled out in words, but in images. In fact, there was a, uh, a symbol that was found uh, in some sundown towns around the south uh, an image of a black mule. And uh, the mule was always portrayed as being in motion, as if it were walking or running. It wasn't standing still. Uh, the message there is, keep your black ass moving. And these uh, images would be painted on the sides of cliffs or on the roofs of barns, places where they would be visible to black travelers on the road so that those black travelers would see this and know that they were not welcome. Now, if I uh, were to ask, if we were actually you know, in a classroom together and I could do that, and I were to ask people, where do you think these sundown towns were most likely to be found? You know, what states? Uh, most, most often, the responses that I get almost immediately are Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana, uh, the Deep South. And that is not correct. Actually, there were very rarely, if, if any, sundown towns in the Deep South. Instead, uh, they were in what's known as the Upper South. So in this map, you can see uh, that there were a lot of them along the Missouri-Arkansas border, and there were quite a few uh, in the uh, Appalachian region, the southern Appalachian region that goes down uh, through the eastern half of Tennessee and down into northern Alabama and northern Georgia. Now, why is that? Um, oh, and by the way, uh, other sundown towns were found in the Midwest, there were a lot of them in Illinois and Indiana and some in Michigan and in some other places as well that were not in the South. So why is it that this type of uh, threat to African-Americans would exist in the South, but not in the deep South? And how is that connected to sharecropping and cotton agriculture? Well, the answer is simple. Um, the... Uh, the white people in the Deep South did not want to chase away the black people because they wanted them there as cheap labor in the cotton fields or as sharecroppers. These other areas where they were chased out 
were mostly areas where you couldn't grow cotton. And therefore, uh, that type of racism was, uh, was more open to being practiced without costing any of the uh, uh, city fathers any of their profit. And to wrap up our discussion of, uh, of the South and of cotton agriculture, uh, it's time to take a look at, uh, at this little fella, the boll weevil. Boll weevils are hell on cotton. Uh, they destroy cotton plants, and they, uh, they were not in the United States during this whole period that we've been talking about. They migrated northward from Mexico starting in the late 1800s, first showing up in, uh, in Texas in 1893, right around the beginning of the Jim Crow era, uh, ironically. And then by 1903, they were in Louisiana. By 1920, they were all throughout the South, everywhere that cotton was grown. And they absolutely wreaked havoc on the cotton fields all through the South and subsequently wreaked havoc on the Southern economy, which meant that it wreaked havoc on the national economy as well. Now, uh, eventually people figured out how to uh, deal with the boll weevils, uh, but it required some major changes in how cotton was grown, and uh, the cotton never really quite recovered. Um, it no longer reigned as king in the South, and uh, Egypt and India, which had started regaining their market share uh, globally during the Civil War when there was no Southern cotton going out, uh, sort of started pulling ahead again, so that while there is still cotton grown in the South, in the U.S., um, in places like Mississippi and Texas, there's not nearly as much as there once was. And that is good. It's good for the environment because, and ultimately it's good for the economy, because essentially the boll weevil did what the Civil War couldn't do. It forced the South to diversify its crops. And Actually, when you, when you think about it, uh, something similar happened on a smaller scale when uh, the tobacco companies started losing lawsuits in the 1990s and tobacco became less lucrative. And uh, in areas, particularly like in, in Tennessee that I'm familiar with, uh, all of a sudden there's not uh, as much, if any, uh, tobacco being grown. That led to more diversification in crops. So sort of kicking and struggling and against their own will, the South was pulled forward into a better condition. And that, uh, as a Southerner, I can say is usually how it happens. <laughs>